सिस्टर एंड ब्रदर जजेस ऑफ दी बॉम्बे हाई कोर्ट टू डिस्टिंग रिटायर्ड जजेस ऑफ दी बॉम्बे हाई कोर्ट प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर अनूप सुरेंद्रनाथ अदर मेंबर्स ऑफ द फैकल्टी ऑफ लॉ यूनिवर्सिटी एट दिल्ली आई एम रियली थैंकफुल टू दी ऑर्गेनाइजर्स फॉर इन्वाइटिंग मी टू दिस लेक्चर one is of course uh, this subject is very dear to me and the second reason is that after gap of say 19 years i got opportunity to enter a premises of this historic high court building there are various facets of this subject i'll be elaborating on that but before i start with the subject i must tell you that this project 39a which is a fair trial fellowship of national law university delhi is such an excellent project i hope and trust that the uh, professor uh, surendranath will circulate uh, soft copies of the work done by them actually if you go through they had sent me two booklets it's an eye opener for those who are working in judicial system and i hope and trust that they will continue with this work today is not the time to describe what exactly they have done but i'll request them to share uh, the soft copies of the work which they have done with the members of the bar and especially uh, the judges of our judiciary uh, the uh, uh, judges of the high court and i am very glad that uh, the organizers have invited judges of our district and trial judiciary they are here in large numbers uh, to begin with i must say that uh, today i am going to express my personal views i have been part of uh, different constitutional courts three constitutional courts for last more than 20 years i have been a practicing lawyer for last 20 years prior to that fortunately i could work uh, with legal services authority as chairperson of the high court legal services committee thereafter executive chairman of the legal services authority i had occasion to visit almost all jails Uh, all central jails in maharashtra except perhaps the high security prison at tarojha in raigad district and therefore i have seen the condition of under trials i have seen the conditions of those who are undergoing conviction i am not going to be traditional in the sense that i am not going to refer to any judgment of the supreme court starting with uh, husain ara khatun sunil batra one sunil batra two and various other judgments when we Uh, think about access to justice my experience for last several years shows that uh, we are ignoring one very important class of the society 75 years after independence still there is large class a large number of citizens in our society who even do not understand that they are suffering from injustice there is a second category which is prevailed that prevails in different uh, sections of the society there there are people who know that they are suffering injustice they know that their fundamental rights are being breached but for social economic and various other reasons they even do not think of adopting a legal remedy now these are the two classes of citizens for which we have hardly done any work during last 75 years i mean there are number of cases i can always tell you one uh, in first and foremost is women who are subjected to brutal harassment in their matrimonial homes on one hand of course we talk about misuse of provisions like uh, 498a etc and there is a misuse nobody can deny that but the real issue is that those who are really suffering now they suffer silently they do, don't go to the police station and register a complaint now we have uh, one more class we suffer silently that class of workers where they are not organized if they are supported by union some labor organization some of them do get justice but at various levels the daily wages and Uh, workers domestic workers they keep on suffering and they don't have remedy one more class like tribals for example they have certain rights in forests 
there are certain rights in respect of agricultural lands but this is one class where which is completely deprived of legal remedies so therefore uh, after 75 years of independence and after 75 years of existence of constitution apart from the huge challenge which we are facing of docket explosion we are really confronted with one more huge problem which is more important is of docket exclusion still large number of our population is excluded from the from seeking the legal remedies and when we talk about access to justice we do talk about of course uh, those who are arrested those who are under trials those who are facing trials those who have been convicted no doubt about it but when we talk about access to justice we must also think about giving legal aid to the victims of the offense about 2 years back i had occasion to deal with uh, a litigation i can talk about it because now that final judgment has been delivered that was a case where grievance was made about non implementation of the report submitted by justice b n sri krishna about the riots in mumbai in 1992 93 and then we found there that nobody provided aid to the victims there was a scheme on paper that uh, those who suffered or property was burned somebody died in the family they were entitled to some kind of a compensation almost all cases criminal cases which were lodged in those days were resulted into acquittal so this is one more area that even the victims of the offense uh, they require legal assistance but we are our system ignores them i'll come to that little later I, I, or i'll just complete this topic of uh, legal aid to the victims now after amendment to section 372 of crpc now victim can file an appeal as a matter of right and in fact see the intention of the legislature if the state or prosecuting agency wants to file an appeal against acquittal they have to take leave under uh, section 378 but as far as appeal by appeal against acquittal by the victim is concerned they don't require leave just appeal is as a matter of right but how many cases uh, the legal services authorities or ngos are extending uh, extending legal aid to the victim of the offense to challenge the uh, acquittal that is not happening there are limited powers for example under section 301 there is a limited power where uh, victim can appoint an advocate who assists the public prosecutor he has right to file written submissions now in how many cases legal services authorities are appointing lawyers to do what is contemplated by subsection 2 of section 301 of crpc we are not extending them any relief so that is one area which is again a neglected area then we talk about uh, access to justice being denied to those who are languishing in jail or those who are victims of the police at atrocities or atrocities of the state but there are so many who are deprived of uh, legal remedy to approach ordinary civil courts look at the cases of uh, uh, people residing in slums in uh, leading cities in india now their shelter is taken away but they they don't approach the court now this is one area where we have not done any work now there is one class of course there is one class which says that look ultimately these people are squatting on the government land they are illegally constructing the huts and they are staying there we don't realize what is the real issue i dealt with a issue in bombay high court where the issue was whether those those who are residing in slums of mumbai illegal slums they are of, of course illegal they are on public property they are constructed by the side of the road whether they are entitled to have water supply as a matter of right so some eminent citizens of mumbai there are two retired is officers they intervened they brought on record a data which was shocking the data showed that about 24% of the police constables working in the city of mumbai in police force they were occupying slums now take a case of any leading city take case of bombay pune bangalore for that matter nagpur also any big city in india today the issue is that suppose somebody who is getting salary of 25000 or 30000 rupees per month and he is posted in bombay he can't afford to have accommodation only choice left available is to go to some slum area and stay there nobody goes nobody goes to slums because he likes it because he has no option how to get housing in uh, in bigger cities they have no option but to go and stay in slums 
that's a huge uh, uh, crisis which we are facing so repeatedly we get a, we uh, uh, come across cases where they are deprived of shelter i remember i was in bangalore in pandemic when lockdown was going on there was uh, a colony a slum colony of migrant workers some of them had gone back because under the orders of the court we facilitated them to go back to their respective states suddenly one uh, night all the shanties were burnt now there was nobody who could help them because they were not uh, getting any income their work had stopped so there was one uh, very leading uh, lawyer from bangalore he wrote a letter to me he and his wife both wrote, uh, wrote a letter to me we initiated public interest litigation we ensured that they are paid compensation so this is one area where uh, people are deprived of shelter but we are not helping them to seek justice there are matrimonial disputes for example now matrimonial disputes have become very costly affair in india i'll deal with that little later one more area which i talked about now there are industrial courts there are labor courts there are authorities under the minimum wages act those workers class of workers who are organized they get benefit of uh, services of union leaders there's a union a union has their own panel lawyers but those who are working at individual level they hardly can afford to go to uh, these tribunals which are created for their benefit same is the case with agricultural tenants so when we think about access to justice we can't be thinking only about those who are victims of the police atrocities or those who are under trials those who are facing criminal trials in fact if you think about justice you go to the preamble of the constitution preamble uses the word justice everybody knows that but what is that justice justice is three social economic and political so when we the constitution framers of the constitution talked about justice it is not justice which is available in our court of laws or tribunals there is a wider concept of justice and that i realized long back see one is one class i will tell you now there are various schemes of the government for poor people one is sanjay gandhi niradhar yojana there is a very wonderful scheme of the government maharashtra government that's there in all states perhaps that where a woman who is a below poverty line woman is provided with a, a a cooking gas and cylinder two cylinders per year these are the schemes which are not available so as a chairperson of legal service authority we got some feedback i remember in 2018 and 19 we had held two uh, legal aid fairs one was here very close to this place at mool in chandrapur the concept which was evolved that concept was actually evolved in madhya pradesh in 2017 there was a legal aid fair the concept was that there are elementary schemes which are available to common man but people either due to ignorance or due to whatever happens at the government offices at that grassroots level they were deprived of that so we devised a scheme we followed actually madhya pradesh model we enlarged it the scheme was that our paralegal volunteers the the students of law colleges and some social workers they went in that area they found out the names of addresses of beneficiaries of those schemes a woman who is entitled to cooking gas or somebody who must get uh, benefit under sanjay gandhi nirar yojana so two months they did the speed work i had called the collector and commissioner we had a meeting we said that we are going to uh, you will get the credit we'll only bring applications to you you give them relief and in the in the legal aid fair you can distribute the reliefs uh, in symbolic manner but we are not going to take credit so there are about 30000 people uh, assembled there and uh, so many so many people got the relief somebody got certificates under sanjay gandhi nirar yojana symbolically somebody got the cooking gas now you require pan card and aadhar card i was shocked in those days the collector came to me he said sir at grassroots level this is a backward area mooli is backward area people don't know that they have to apply for aadhar card and pan card so we had a stalls of aadhar card and pan card we got income tax department and aadhar organization hundreds of people registered themselves there was one scheme which i was not aware we also learn as judges when we encounter so many difficulties there was a scheme you know pregnant women sometimes they are advised this uh, ultrasonography now there is a scheme that for women below the poverty line this facility must be extended free of cost so somebody pointed out to me therefore there was a primary health center we obtained all licenses under that act and about 75 80 women were provided that benefit so actually 
this kind of a thing we have never thought about that people are entitled to so many privileges but we are not able to extend them those privileges and these are not the persons who will go to writ court and file a writ petition under article 226 one more area where really people are deprived of justice now we all of us know under article 21 right to health is also a fundamental right article 21 says that every human being every citizen has right to lead a meaningful life now meaningful life is not animal existence that includes the right to have uh, medical help good health now look at the plight of our primary health centers in uh, when i was a law student and then as a junior lawyer there was a, a one ngo which used to work in remote areas of raigad district in maharashtra it's a coastal district so we used to run this health camps in remote places and those were the days i am talking about uh, uh, early 80s and uh, early 90s late 80s and early 90s there are lot many patients of tuberculosis so we were wondering now how to provide medicines we are getting donations etc so we went we inquired now all primary health centers used to get huge stock of uh, medicines on tuberculosis but the medicines used to disappear within two days so i am talking about these, where are the facilities for to common man where are the primary health centers the network of primary health centers which was contemplated hardly exist so there the right which is guaranteed under article 21 right to health we are depriving people of the right to health and that became very apparent uh, in pandemic we learned so many things sitting on the bench while dealing with covid bench under the food security act there is a provision there are rules or act i forget where is that provision but to uh, children belonging to poor family they are entitled to free food and free food used to be served through anganwadis that's a scheme now anganwadis were closed these poor children did not get food now that's a right provided under the statute that certain category of children will get free food breakfast and i think two meals but they were deprived of that now what happens at anganwadi is whether they really get those benefits we do not know in fact so many benefits are supposed to be provided through anganwadis we have that network of anganwadis but how many benefits actually reach those who are entitled to it we do not know so these are the you know wider concepts of uh, access to justice one more striking example i'll do i dealt with that litigation in uh, bangalore we passed several orders rt act and there are rules framed right to education act you know there is there are really very good provisions now one provision in rule says that there has to be yearly survey of students who have never enrolled in the schools up to 14 years you know that there is a free education there is one survey supposed to be carried out in every april of children who had enrolled in the schools but those who have gone out of the school and the idea is that they should be all brought back to the schools this is hardly implemented when article 21a is there there is a corresponding right created in favor of uh, children to get free education but who is looking at their issues nobody is looking at their issues now so i am therefore i am saying that i am just giving few illustrations this is a wider concept of uh, access to justice when you talk about access to justice it is not only uh, helping the persons to fight their litigations or defend their litigations this is the concept of wider concept of uh, justice because that is what justice which is contemplated in the constitution social economic and political so social and economic we are forgetting so therefore these are the issues which should be looked into after 75 years of existence of the constitution and one more thing which uh, we all of us must remember i have said it very loudly and clearly on public platforms that yes there is access to justice there are organizations there are institutions like uh, this university in delhi who are working legal services authorities are there but it is not only access to justice it is access to quality justice there has to be a quality justice i'll speak uh, about that little later now since there are a lot of uh, discussion about the criminal matters you know the real issue starts in criminal matters with one fundamental thing the fundamental thing is forget about common man i am talking about highly educated classes they don't know what are their rights qua police machinery when police can arrest when police can call you to the police station i remember 2 years back there is a state level organization of gynecologists in mumbai 
yearly they arrange these lectures on legal issues. Mainly, they call people to talk about this Consumer Protection Act and medical negligence cases, etc. So I said that I want to talk about uh, uh, criminal justice delivery system. Then I explained to them, I explained to them, what are your rights? When can police arrest you? If you issue a summons from police, what you are supposed to do? So most of the doctors said, sir, this is Greek and Latin for us. We are not aware of that. So therefore, basic lack of knowledge about elementary principles of law in context of Article 20 and 21. What are the duties of the police? What are the rights of the citizen co-op police? We do not know. Nobody knows that if I go to the police station and my complaint is not registered, what is to be done? Now, the first thing which starts with is the remand, when the person is arrested and produced before the magistrate. In judicial academies, we give them training. Brother Justice Sahwan knows that in Maharashtra Judicial Academy, one of our retired judges has prepared a questionnaire that what is the first question to be asked to the uh, accused who is produced bef uh, before the judges. But look at the situation. I'm talking about bigger cities. Go to Bombay, go to Pune, maybe Nagpur, same situation, go to uh, Thane, for example, any leading city, Bangalore. One magistrate deals with how many remand cases every afternoon? 20, 25, 30 cases. Now, where is the time for him to apply his mind? It's the most crucial jurisdiction. You know, that is where the fate of the uh, criminal is decided whether he gets goes into police custody or he goes into judicial custody. Now, we have remand lawyers under the Legal Service Authorities Act. We are not able to give them adequate training. There are remand lawyers available in the court. But look at the grassroots level situation that most of the accused don't get lawyers at remand stage. Though legal service authorities, remand lawyers are sitting in the court. Now, from that is where denial of access to justice really starts. And then he gets either police custody, magisterial custody. And I have seen this very closely. I'll tell you a little diversion, I'll make it. In Bangalore, we found that Bangalore is a big city. There are courts of metropolitan magistrates. Now, people used to, the first remand has to be physical remand. So, in days were pandemic, uh, days of pandemic. So, some police used to come with accused. Next day, we used to know that some police officer is positive COVID. Then the, the standard practice was to close the court to spray that uh, whatever is that uh, liquid. Courts used to remain closed. So, we devised a solution. We told government that give us some deserted property in the city. So we got an old badminton court and there was an adjacent building which was not used and that was in totally commercial area. We set up remand court so that uh, we need not keep the entire building closed if somebody turns positive. So remand court, my registrars, I told them to watch because all accused were produced there. Judges used to see it turn by turn. So one of the registrars was telling me, sir, in 50% of cases, the accused is not represented by a lawyer at the stage of remand. So that is where the first, uh, this is the first step where everybody does not get access to justice, access to true justice. And then comes bail. There is a delay in filing bail applications. Everybody can't afford to go to a lawyer. So there is a delay. Though uh, now, just now somebody, uh, I have seen the booklet published by uh, this 39 project, 39A. So many people were granted bail because uh, uh, the, uh, this project people intervened. So there is delay in filing uh, bail applications. And in the present day now, sadly, I have said in judicial side also, there can I say it openly, getting bail in deserving cases also is very difficult. There are reasons and reasons. I'll analyze those reasons also. Then there are there are delay in filing, delay in getting the bail applications decided. There are reasons and reasons. For Take, for example, Bihar. In Bihar, after that Prohibition Act was brought into force, the Chief Justice, then Chief Justice told me that there is 35% addition in filing of bail matters in the High Court. So at one point of time, 60% of the High Court judges in Patna were doing bail work. Today also position may be the same, maybe 50%. So this is one area where the judges and judiciary has no control. Suddenly there are a number of uh, bail applications which are filed. And now look at what is happening. In Allahabad High Court, Bombay High Court is also not far away. There are 100, 150 matters in Allahabad High Court 
somebody's bail application is listed as serial number 100, 1300, 1400. Now, what do we do? If we don't have adequate number of judges in the high court, bail applications remain pending. And there are some, I mean, fundamental reasons. Now, today you see a scenario. Now, I have been in Supreme Court from, uh, 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 from 31st August 21. Last one year, I am heading a bench. 30% of the cases which come before me are SLPs arising out of order refusing to grant bail. 30%. Now, there are various reasons why bail is not being granted. Now, one of the reasons is one is, of course, advent of social media, the media trial, criticism, etc. Now, why this happens? Why this media trial? Forget about media trial. I'll give an example. In a smaller town, suppose there is a, a very serious offense. Let us take it offense against woman. Now somebody is picked up and shown as accused. Now kind of reaction which uh, judges face. Suppose some judge is bold enough to say that actually uh, this is not, no case is uh, uh, made out against the accused. He grants bail. There's a huge, huge outcry. The human organizations, social organizations, without even bothering to read why the judge has, uh, judge has granted bail. Public out outcry. So many things are said about uh, grant of bail on social media, on print media. The reason is now, though this law exists, most of our citizens, or for learned people, so I am talking about not ordinary person, a very edu highly educated person, they don't understand the difference between Accused being released on bail and accused being acquitted. For common man, common man reacts if bail is granted as if he is acquitted. Because, see, the concept has undergone change. If you read CRPC, in fact, it is not mandatory that only because offence alleging commission of cognizable offence has been registered, it is not mandatory that accused should be taken into custody. There can be investigation without taking person into custody. But now, some offense takes place, some serious offense takes place, there, the, there is a pressure on the police machinery to get somebody arrested and put in, in inside the bail. Sadly, people derive satisfaction into that. Look, now somebody is arrested. It's good now, he must remain in jail for quite some time. So, the social media, you know, see, we are, judges are human beings. Publicly, I have said that just like any other institution in the world. Judiciary is also not infallible. There are flaws in our system. There are various, various areas where we have gone wrong, we are going wrong. But ultimately, judges are human beings. Some session just granting bail in a sensitive case, find what kind of things he faces, what kind of things are said about the judges on the social media. There's one more area which is of grave concern. I'm not going to name those uh, cases something, a brutal offense uh, is there in the society, maybe against woman, maybe case of dacoity, maybe case of murder. And naturally, I mean, every citizen is concerned. So there is a public outcry. I mean, in modern society, how there can be such offense against woman, or how there can be daylight dacoity or daylight murder. And then there is pressure on the police machinery, police machinery arrest somebody. And now we have a scenario where politicians, without understanding what is the evidence against the accused, they make a public statement that will ensure that this man is hanged. Now, please remember, a session just sitting in court, if media reports the statements by highest authorities, political authorities in the state, that will ensure that this man is hanged, how much pressure he will carry in the back of his mind. You know, these are the factors which sometimes control uh, the, I mean, what we call it, uh, uh, ultimately it remains in the back of mind of the judges. I am not just, uh, justifying why bail is being denied, but this is a grassroots level situation which we have to remember, that we live in a society where people don't appreciate grant of bail, people don't appreciate acquittal. But of course, I am not defending that. When we are judges, we are bound by law, we are bound by constitution, if a case is made out for grant of bail, it is our duty to release a person on bail irrespective of the consequences. Now, there are judges who feel that, you know, if session just grants bail, 
or session just grant acquittal, perhaps it is not taken kindly by the High Court administration. There may be a perception. I am not saying, I am not denying that. That may be happening. But ultimately, we as judges, we have to do our duty. We can't say that if I, uh, you know, I can't think about it. If I grant bail or I grant acquittal, what will happen to me? But at the same time, these are the human issues because we are all human beings. As judges, we are human beings. So therefore, media trial, the kind of things which are said on the social media about the judges, you know, it's sometimes it is so difficult. We as judges, we may not be reading uh, the uh, Twitter or X, whatever we call, or Instagram. But our children read it. Sometimes our children read something which is very obnoxious said about ourselves. They confront us that, look, what is said about you in the social media. So ultimately, as a family, it has effect. But again, I'll say that when we have taken the oath under the Constitution, I may be a session judge, I may be a magistrate, I am bound by law, and I have to perform my duty to the best of my ability. So therefore, uh, this is one area a situation in society. Therefore, actually the need of the hour is to educate the masses that what is the meaning of registration of offense? What is the meaning of order granting bail? By granting bail, a person is not acquitted. Court doesn't give him a clean chit. Masses have to be educated about one thing that arrest is not the only solution. Arrest is not the only requirement for carrying on the uh, investigation. Now, today in court, these arguments are made. We get a case, even High Court has encountered this. We get a case where we feel that it's a grant of bail. So the prosecutor gets up, somebody appearing for the first informer gets up, he says, Sir, he has, been, he has undergone only for two years. So I always to tell the uh, lawyers and public prosecutor, is it the criteria? Is there any some unwritten rule or written rule that in 302 cases, person has to undergone 10 years? or five years before his release on bail. If he's entitled to release on bail, he has to be released on bail. But that is how it's happening in, in constitutional court, such arguments are made, in Supreme Court, such arguments are made. Other day, I was hearing an uh, appeal against uh, 302 case, it was a clear case of acquittal, case of no evidence. Only argument by the uh, first informant and the prosecutor was, look, sir, look at the PM report. Two people have been killed, case of double murder. So I have to tell the distinguished lawyers that, yes, I understand it's a double murder, but what I am supposed to deal with is whether there is legal evidence against the accused to convict him. You know, therefore, the lack of knowledge of elementary principles of criminal law in our society, that is something we will have to work on. I always used to say as chairperson of legal service authority that we need uh, legal literacy programs not only in rural areas, but we need in urban areas more. Because the urban population who claim themselves to be very elite, they react in a long manner about our, the, what happens in our criminal justice delivery system. Now, the main issue which confronts us, main issue which actually affects the effective address, uh, access to justice, in main issue is of, I, as I said, delay is one issue. Quality is another issue. Now, why there is a delay? There are various reasons for delay. One reason is we, for traditionally after independence, I have said it in upteen number of occasions, some of we thought that only important courts are the constitutional courts. We completely neglected our trial and district judiciary. In fact, uh, I always felt very bad when somebody calls a civil judge court or magistrate's court as a lower court, there is nothing like lower court. I have said so in one of my judgments also, and nothing like lower court. Because that is how we look upon that judiciary. In, in fact, for common man, that is perhaps the first and last thing, first and last opportunity to get the justice. So we never paid enough attention to our revamping our trial courts and district courts. I always call it a trial courts and district courts. And mo one reason is, uh, I'll give you only one example. I'm, in 2002, Supreme Court delivered a judgment. That judgment said, that judgment referred to just to population ratio. How many days should be there for population of 1 million, 10 lakhs? So in some developed countries, it was 100. Some developed countries, it was 70, 80, 113. Those figures are there in that judgment. The Supreme Court said that within 10 years in India, the just to population ratio must be 50. So by 2012, 50. And Supreme Court said about our trial and district courts. Today, you, do you know? 
टूडे वी आर स्ट्रगलिंग एट ट्वेंटी टू टू ट्वेंटी थ्री इन टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी फोर वेन आफ्टर दैट ऑर्डर देर आर नंबर ऑफ पीनल स्टैचूट विच आर कम इन टू फोर्स वी आर स्ट्रगलिंग एट ट्वेंटी टू और ट्वेंटी थ्री वन मोर जजमेंट ऑफ द सुप्रीम कोर्ट आई थिंक ए कमिटी हेडेड बाय प्रोफेसर मोहन गोपाल वॉज अपॉइंटेड दैट कमिटी वॉज इंटरेस्टेड टास्क ऑफ वर्किंग आउट आइडियली सम फॉर्म्यूला बाय विच वी कैन कैलकुलेट वॉट शुड बी द जस्ट स्ट्रेंथ सो देर इज रिपोर्ट्स इंटरनेम रिपोर्ट सबमिटेड बाय जस्टिस मोहन गोपाल एंड सुप्रीम कोर्ट डायरेक्टेड बाय ऑफ इंटरनेम रिलीफ दैट एवरी हाईकोर्ट मस्ट कैलकुलेट रिक्वायर जस्ट स्ट्रेंथ ऑफ आवर डिस्ट्रिक्ट एंड ट्रायल जुडिशरी एंड सबमिट अ प्रपोजल टू द गवर्नमेंट आई वॉज मेंबर ऑफ द कमिटी विच वॉज सपोज टू डू दिस If we had calculated as per that that particular formula in Maharashtra, we needed twelve thousand more judicial officers. So we made a different calculation, and I think two thousand sixteen we submitted our requirement as some eight thousand. And other day I read in newspapers when I had gone to Bombay that after that demand, recently government of Maharashtra has sanctioned some eight hundred and sixty posts. Now please go to. Uh, magistrates court in all leading cities look at number of cases they deal with 100 110 120 where is the time for application of mine i gave example of remand courts if you are going to deal with 20 25 remands on every day where is the time for application of mine so one of the reasons for this congestion of cases in the courts is this reason that we don't have adequate number of judges i am not talking about infrastructure i always share this i sorry some of you must have heard me saying this you must be aware that fifth sixth and seventh pay commission came all public servants got benefit we judges of the constitutional court we are not bound by that we are not covered by that therefore a committee was appointed and committee submits a report after Uh, the pay commission report is out and we got enhancement by amendment of the statute but our trial court judges and district court judges is the only category of public servants which receive the benefit of pay commission at the last now the i think seventh pay commission came with effect from i think 2016 last year when supreme court passed an order directing government to give enhanced pay scale that our judges got benefit in 2022 23 sorry and i think the benefit of perquisites came very recently this one category of public servants is always neglected of course i say that i say that even considering that it's a public service today the salary and perquisites are not that bad in fact now our civil judges who enter judiciary they get slightly better salary than uh, those who enter from ias and ips category today that's the situation but i am on the approach how our judiciary working in trial and district courts is neglected in some of the states of course that things are different in karnataka for example there beautiful infrastructure good residential premises i am not defending the judges in fact i was the one i always say that you know we must introspect we must find out what are the faults we have been committing mistakes we are not able to deliver justice but look at the other side in many uh, cities in maharashtra there is one locality where there are bungalows and residential houses of uh, uh, collectors deputy collectors commissioners uh, pwd officers i'll give example of my own city thane there is a one locality known as bara bungalow justice sawan knows about it this is this is joshi also seen that so there is a beautiful pathway created for walk even today i go for walk sometimes in vacations and i always tell my friends look if you take a round in the area it is very very easy to understand to identify the residences of judges we have the best residences in most good condition are pwd officers collectors and police officers and judges residence in thane i today also i have seen about uh, two months back some of the structures are covered by tarpaulin so you can recognize these are the residences of judges so we have not in other states there are good facilities in some states but this is also one area which we have to remember that these are these are the limitations on the functioning of the judges one more area where we have to work very hard the area is of fixing right priorities which are the cases which should be given priority 
there are statutes like hindu marriage act i think it is 6 months or i think um, domestic violence act it is 6 months there are various statutes i think under uh, subject to correction negotiable instruments act so 138 6 months of course there are judicial decisions we say that they are all directory they can't be mandatory so which are the cases we should be given priority there are no hard and fast rules for example i'll give an example i don't know why i have been i have been advocating for change of that there is some order of the Supreme Court we said that priority should be given to cases of senior citizens. And therefore, in High Court, so many applications we used to say, Sir, I am a senior citizen. Now, can you say that somebody who is 61 years old, can he be called a senior citizen in today's context? That is a different topic. I am not discussing that. But the problem with, is this, with this kind of approach that give priority to all cases of senior citizens. We have second appeals in, in High Courts, various High Courts. There, there is third generation of litigants because second appeals remain pending for 20 years or 30 years, I don't know, Now, some cases 30 years. Third generation of litigants are parties and we are talking about a blanket provision where senior citizens' cases should be given priority. Very interesting thing used to happen for a long time I used to preside over family court appeal bench in Bombay High Court. So, so many applications used to come to me. There are one application where lawyer was also very vociferous. He said, sir, both husband and wife are above 60 years. Now, look at this circular, immediately hear it. So I told them that, look, why should I give priority to husband and wife who are above 60 who are fighting? I'll give priority to somebody, a young couple who is in 20s and 30s and 40s, because they have to start new life. So this is where our priorities go wrong. And another case which I have said openly in my orders, constitutional courts fixing time bound schedule. In high court, somebody says, I all right, I am not inclined to grant bail. Lawyer says, expedite the trial. In Supreme Court, we do it. Uh, see, my client is in jail for five years. When we say sitting in constitutional court, decide the case within six months, we do not know that in that particular session's court, there are under trials who are undergone 10 years, 12 years, 9 years, 15 years. But only because somebody goes to the higher court, constitutional court, he gets this pro uh, order and other people patiently wait in the queue. I have said that in my judicial order in Supreme Court. So many orders, not one order. That those who can afford to go to higher court, they walk away with such orders. Now, is this a way of giving priority? The priority has to be on some kind of a scientific basis which cases we are going to give priority. One more area, now why the common man is not getting timely justice? Look at one enactment, Negotiable Instruments Act, Section 138. It's a purely civil liability. We are converted into a, cr a criminal liability. Now those cases are supposed to be given preference. Six months is the limit. Now people are, instead of going to civil court, people are going to criminal court. There are cash transactions which get legitimacy by if the check is dishonored. And look at, go to any major city, 25% cases are under Negotiable Instruments Act in Magistrates Court. So, this is a matter of legislative policy. I can't say that validity of the section has been upheld. But ultimately, this is an area where the legislature will have to show some kind of a concern that how we are uh, trivially criminalizing a civil wrong and that ultimately affects the administration of justice. There is one more area. One more area is now after Commercial Court Act came into force. Now there is a mandate that we must give priority to commercial litigations. Now we have Arbitration Act 1996. Now, our courts are flooded with Section 9, Section 34, Section 37. Now, how much time our constitutional courts are consuming? Because somehow in India, the arbitration has become synonymous with bulky pleadings, bulky arguments, lengthy arguments, and bulky uh, awards. Just I, as a student of law, sometimes I look at the award when I get cases. And I just imagine if this issue would have gone to civil court. Now here I have, I have award of 150 pages. 
perhaps traditional civil court would have delivered judgment running into 50 pages because there are bulky pleadings and bulky arguments and lengthy arguments the length of the award increases how much time of the constitutional courts is consumed by these cases how much time is consumed of the civil courts now civil courts have powers of the commercial courts and we are supposed to give priority to those cases uh, how much and look at on one scenario commercial uh, uh, commercial suits we are giving priority there are partition suits there are suits where people fight over uh, their share in ancestral property there is a widow who is deprived of her small share in half acre of the property they are all wait in the queue we are giving priority to commercial cases i mean this these are the matters to be considered by legislature but when legislature will consider it when right thinking people in the society will develop that kind of approach that we need a priority to be given fixed priorities have to be there which cases should be given priority and which cases should be wait in the queue there has to be policy on this in fact when i address the uh, high court judges in national judicial academy i tell them that look don't try to dispose of all cases at admission stage the reason is you must find out which cases are to dispose of admission stage if you want to remand the matter or if it is it is against the interim order because if you grant interim relief the trial will remain state dispose of those cases otherwise in the endeavor to dispose of 2023 and 2024 cases at admission stage there are 20 years old first appeals 20 year old criminal appeals or revision application they remain pending we live in a system there is a system that if certain matters require final hearing they have to be admitted and heard thereafter we can't as a constitutional court as judges of the high court be try to endeavor to decide all cases at admission stage we are doing injustice to other people who are waiting in the queue so this is a kind of this is a this is one area where all of us will have to put our heads together and come out with some kind of a policy there is one more area where we need to cons uh, seriously consider the, the cost of litigation what is the cost of litigation in india in fact now supreme court realized about 10 years back what about middle class because if you go to the legal services authority act section 12 i think the limit the upper limit for uh, granting legal aid is something like 9000 12000 section 12 look at middle class people some teacher who wants to go to the court for pension common man middle class people they can't afford to have litigation look at the fee structure and litigation doesn't end look at what is happening in our matrimonial matters for example now one matrimonial dispute leads to five litigations now main under hindu marriage act or whichever is that matrimonial law domestic violence act section 125 498a and if husband and wife are well educated now because of exchange of whatsapp messages under uh, this uh, information technology act one matrimonial dispute leads to five litigations and then there are revisions appeals and what not sessions court district court high court supreme court how many cases which come to us for transfer petitions in supreme court transfer from one state to another of course as a matter of policy we are now sending all the them to mediations or we mediate there now imagine how much money litigants must be spending everybody can't afford to spend five litigations so five different lawyers have to be engaged in lawyers in the higher court so what what kind of money people get frustrated i will share one example with you in 2010 uh, i was sitting single with this 482 and 227 criminal side matters so there was one um, petition came to me some interlocutory order either summoning witness or something arising out of 138 case or challenge before me the complainant was a small time trader very small time trader from some uh, district place some taluka place in pune educated man so notice was issued by me so he came and appeared in person so he said sir i have to tell you one thing this is fifth time i am dragged to the court now check amount is 1 lakh 75000 i almost spent same amount on engaging lawyers so my request your my request to you is please compel the accused to settle i am prepared to settle any amount fortunately the lawyer for complainant was uh, really reasonable somehow we could arrive at a figure which represented 5000 less than check amount but the litigant was prepared to accept that 
because the cost of litigation and the length of litigation now that is one area now supreme court has formed a society under society registration act which is supposed to help the middle class litigants of course that so far it has not really taken off in fact pursuant to the directions of the supreme court uh, in bombay high court also we registered society in 2018 uh, i don't know what happened at that time because uh, uh, thereafter i have no contact at all so the idea was that that society registered under society act will come will generate some kind of a uh, money from donations etc and provide uh, monetary help to middle class citizens so that is one area where you know we have to work and that is all see it's not only about uh, poor people it is about those who are forced to approach the court in fact i always say that you know for so many years we kept on patting our backs that you know common man has confidence in our system co people come to our court because they have faith in the court but if you see as judges only if there is no other option left that people come to the court they try to patch up they use different methods to bring about settlement and some of, some of them use the court machinery for example now these uh, commercial disputes now they file a complaint 420 406 or they apply under 156.3 get the uh, fir registered only object is to bring the accused to the table and have commercial settlement so these are the kind of cases which come to the court but then ultimately we have to see, we have to think about common man's perspective i am not talking about very poor person i am talking about common man's perspective how we can give him quality justice how we can improve the access to justice now there is one scheme which came recently i am going to another topic the other topic is that people comment lot about the caliber of legal aid lawyers who are provided uh, to defend the accused who cannot afford to engage lawyers now recently supreme court has come out with the scheme national legal service authority the scheme is known as legal aid defense remuneration council scheme 2022 object is very good to create a cadre of uh, these lawyers but look at the remuneration remuneration is very poor we need to increase that because once you become part of uh, that scheme you are not supposed to go for private practice it's a good initiative that you create a cadre of these lawyers who will appear pro bono pro bono in the sense that they are paid but they will appear for those litigants who can't afford to engage a lawyer in criminal cases but there we have to uh, really uh, make some efforts and increase the remuneration the other area where we can improve access to justice i'll tell you from my first hand experience in bombay high court a litig pil was filed long back in 2014 uh, there was uh, in palghar district one uh, power project came and therefore two villages were completely displaced and it was a brilliant idea by government in those days they recreated those two villages under same uh, name same revenue uh, name was given the same and the issue was whether those uh, small uh, time people some of them were fishermen some of them were doing some small jobs or some of them were working on farms so they were houses were constructed in these two newly formed villages and they were shifted there so issue was of rehabilitation and a chief justice passed an order that high chairman of the high court legal services committee will on the administrative side will go there will talk to people and try to give them better facilities so i had occasion to go there i visited those villages we used to hold meetings in our uh, high court i had to bring the chair the uh, secretary of the attorney general department money was not coming the divisional commissioner collectors everybody used to come some of we were not able to impress them there is a maharashtra national law school one of the youngest law schools in india so i thought that i'll get bright students from that national law school then we prepared a questionnaire i uh, requested some of the professors to assist me and we told the young lawyers i held a workshop for about 3 hours in high court i told them that go there you will learn a new lesson in your life how people live there i had gone there earlier there are no facilities of education there are no sanitary facilities nothing was there so these young students went to those two villages they stayed there for 3 days they used to stay in palghar again go in the morning and they used to spend time till evening they prepared a survey report 
And on the basis of their survey report, they pre two girls prepared uh, a um, uh, PowerPoint presentation. And I had called everybody, Secretary of the Atomic Energy Department, everybody. And I said, now look at a different approach. Now I'll show you on screen this PowerPoint presentation. The kind of work which was done by these young students, you are so phenomenal that the Secretary of Atomic Energy Department, sir, now I understood what is the problem. I'll see that government releases, central government releases more money to the state and I'll myself coordinate. So now we have to look upon younger generation of law students who work as paralegal volunteers. I remember we had a mediation conference in Pune. So I was returning back my, from car to Bombay. I received a phone call for, on my cell phone. One woman was calling me. She said, sir, I'm in a very peculiar position. Those were the days 17 or 18. We used to get those uh, public advertisement that if you don't link your account to Aadhaar card, then account will be closed, etc. All of us remember that. She says, uh, sir, I'm in a very peculiar position. Her one arm was amputated. She was on wheelchair. Not that she was a poor lady. She was quite affluent. Stay uh, alone. She had a help also. She said that I read this. I went to on a wheelchair with assistance. I went to a center where Aadhaar card is issued. I was told that they require fingerprints of five or ten fingers. They said you will not get Aadhaar card. So what do I do? She said I read in newspapers about your speech. I got number from one of the district court staff members. You please help me. Now my account will be closed. What do I do? I called one of the professors in one of the law colleges. I said please put some. Uh, paralegal one young law, uh, law students on the job. I don't know what they did. Perhaps they must have gone from uh, office to office. Within four days, a team of those UDI officials, they went with machines to her house. And within seven days, Aadhaar card was delivered at the doorsteps. I am just giving you one uh, illustration that we have to now target these young students and we have to educate them. We we'll have to mentor them. And they can do wonders as uh, paralegal volunteers, as this project people, the students who are involved in this project, they are doing it. Because there I see a hope that if we create a battalion of paralegal volunteers, may, may not be even students of law, students of other, uh, other fields also, why not? Medicine, students of medicine can be there, students of commerce, arts can be there. That is the only hope. Now, they are the ones who should be trained. They should go to villages. They should go to various places. And they should do active work uh, as uh, paralegal volunteers. Because there are so many issues. Uh, rehabilitation, I forgot to tell you. Rehabilitation is a major issue. There are displaced persons from projects. They, there are litigations in high court. There are litigations at all level. But someday we must ask a question to ourselves. Are they getting real justice? Are they, in true sense, rehabilitated? So these are the issues where the present legal system, the present lawyers, they, they are found to be inadequate to deal with this kind of situation. So we need uh, something different to be done, some different approach, some out-of-box thinking. If we do that, of course, legislature will have to step in. We, members of the judiciary, will have to introspect. In fact, now next year, uh, 26th of November, will complete 75 years of adoption of our constitution. 26th January, 75 years of actual implementation of the constitution. And in fact, if you look at the constitution, starting from preamble, that reflects the aspirations, the thinking of framers of our constitution that actually represents the you know, sacrifice of freedom fighters. They knew what are the aspirations of uh, the citizens of independent India. And therefore, there is emphasis in our constitution that citizens must get justice, justice in wider sense. And they must naturally get effective access to justice. Article 39A came a little later. But the principles are very much there in the constitution. If you see the uh, various judgments of the Supreme Court, or for example, uh, or otherwise also these debates. So when we complete 75 years, those who are associated with judiciary, not only the judges, but the members of the bar, now they will have to really introspect and assess where we have gone wrong. If at all we have gone wrong, which areas we have gone wrong, which areas we have to improve. Because unless we accept that in legal system there are flaws, we won't be able to improve. 
So this 75 years, is, it will be a huge occasion for those who are connected with the legal system that, that applies to even the, uh, those who are part of legal education to introspect and to think uh, where we have gone wrong and what we need to do in future to make our justice delivery system more effective and more citizen friendly. And that is going to be a challenge before us when we, we have celebrated already 75 years of independence, now 75 years of existence of constitution. In fact, uh, this is the time when all of us will have to put our head heads together and think about improving the access to justice. And I think I must close here, I can go on and on. But uh, I again thank uh, all these uh, people who are sitting here, the faculty members, that they have taken up this cause. It's very important. I don't know how many of you know that in one of the conferences of Bar Council, I said something for which I was criticized. I said that somehow I carry an impression, though I am myself associated with different national law schools, that are we creating elite class of lawyers through these national law schools? But I think uh, at least in case of one law school, I must withdraw that statement after seeing what you have done. And therefore, it's important that national law schools do this. At least that impression is there. Some of my colleagues and some judicial officers will agree with me that there is an impression. And I said about a very prominent uh, private university and uh, the vice chancellor was there that are we creating very light class of lawyers, you know. But anyway, I am glad that somebody has proved me wrong. So I thank all of you for this great initiative. I thank all of you who are present here and who have given me patient hearing. Though as a judge, I have not known to reciprocate by giving patient hearing. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. I wish a great success to your project. Take a few questions from the audience. Good evening, sir. Uh, yes, uh, I'm humbled and grateful to have your words. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Honorable Justice, sir. I'm Dr. Nitin Golarka. I did my PhD from East Mumbai, and I uh, research uh, on uh, the uh, tribal rights. So when I was uh, working on the action project in Chandrapur, uh, so uh, I found under the uh, Forest Pets Act 2006, uh, when uh, the community people have applied for the uh, IFR and CFR rights. So due to not produce the uh, evidence of three generations, uh, their rights have been neglected. And uh, these are the national data which has been uh, published by the uh, Climate Change, Environment and Foundation Ministry. Only 2% of the forest states has been recognized nationally. So uh, the data uh, reveals that significant population of, uh, belongs to the tribal community uh, that has been uh, um, misrights. This is the main query. Just off and answer I'll give you. As I understand, uh, apart from uh, facilities available to approach the redressal mechanism, the re real issue which you canvass is that they are not able to prove that for generations they are in possession. Now, you know, that is something, in some case, there has to be judicial interpretation. Because, you know, there is a concept of uh, what is the extent of burden. See, there are certain facts which law recognizes could be proved by preponderance of probability. Strict evidence is not required. So perhaps in a suitable case, constitutional, uh, constitutional courts will have to adjudicate upon it. But considering the fact that they are tribals, what kind of evidence they can produce. So the standard of evidence which is required, that can be lowered depending upon the interpretation of the provision. That's the only option which I see, apart from encouraging people to assert their rights. That's the only option because these, there is no adjudication on this question because people feel that they can't prove that they are there for generations. Perhaps they may not be accessing to uh, remedies available. Uh, my name is Jaydeep Pandey. I still just non-basket. Uh, 
uh, my lord has uh, talked about the legal aid to the victim of, uh, of the crime, as well as LADCS, legal aid to this counseling system, which we have uh, now uh, in this uh, recommended. Uh, so my question is regarding uh, when we can provide the legal aid to this counseling system to accused. Why not there is the separate system to the victim or other uh, other class of society? Okay. We present it through LADCS, like the LADCS system. See, now, I actually, I had occasion to discuss that in a reported judgment. Uh, see, now, which are the legal provisions under which uh, legal aid can be given? Under 3012, they have a right to engage a lawyer. That's a different thing. Now, one is, if you see the uh, legal section 12, any woman or child is entitled to legal aid, irrespective of the income, etc. So, if woman is the victim, Surely, legal service authority can give legal aid. In, say, POXO case or child is a victim, the legal aid can be given because that is already a category. But we need to, that's what the discussion going on, that we need to amend the law. For example, somebody's family member is murdered. Unless he belongs to that income category, he won't get legal aid under the existing setup of uh, 1987 Act. So that is where legislature will have to step in, or some NGOs will have to do this work. But really, it requires amendment to the act. You know, ultimately, it is for judges to innovate. Now, some cases uh, in common parlance at uh, trial court level, uh, you know, they are lawyers. They are known as watching lawyers, as we call it. If you feel that in a given case, the prosecutor is not e equipped, Always there are good members of the bar, somebody, you can always request who is present in the court, call somebody and request him to take up the case. That can be always done. Pro bono, there are many lawyers, fortunately, but still lawyers community is rich and there are quite a few people who really respond to such requests. So, at your level, you can do it, I mean. Thank you. Sir, I am Dr. Rajan, I am the Director of Central India College of Law. My question to you is, do you still hold the view that national law universities produces elite lawyers or advocates? Uh, no, I'll, I'll now, since you asked this question, which is actually not covered by the topic, still I'll choose to answer that. Uh, see, there are some lawyers I have seen who are practicing before me. Uh, in Karnataka, I had uh, four colleagues uh, who are graduates of National Law School. I am not making a generalized statement, but there are many students in national law schools. Their concept is totally different. And actually, I don't, uh, I mean, what happens in national law schools, I'll tell you. Uh, it happens to any law college also. I, I always criticize the legal system. Are we in encouraging our uh, law students, maybe your college also, are we encouraging them to start criminal practice? Are we encouraging to start, uh, are we encouraging to join career in, uh, take up career in judiciary? This is, this is so about all colleges. The academicians always tell them now how you will prosper in legal profession, but I will add something to that, I have said that openly. Are we encouraging our students to take up career in academics? We need, we need good law teachers also, if our legal system is to survive. So there is a problem with the approach. And the students who come there, they have that kind of expectation that, you know, they will join some big firms, or they want to practice on the commercial side. Uh, is there, I mean, that criticism will remain. But as I said, uh, there are exceptions also to that. There are good. Some of the, I, I, I went, I, I'll give a very interesting thing. Two years back, I went to Bihar Judicial Academy to deliver lectures to uh, those who are joined as civil judges between 2021 to 2022. There were 300 uh, young judges there, out of which 57% were women. There were about 31 from various national law schools. So, that is happening, but I am talking about overall approach. When the why students come to national law schools because they feel that they'll get into into firms, bigger firms or 
some bigger chambers, maybe in Supreme Court or in the High Court. So that kind of approach is there. When I criticized them because that was the subject there, I, my criticism was with a different object, which I am doing as part of the National Law School, where that uh, I always tell the students of National Law School on, a, uh, on the first lecture itself, I tell them that, look, all National Law Schools in India, they have been established on properties given by the state. All National Law Schools were initially funded by the state. So I always tell them that when you are in a National Law School, which is cre creation of the state, which is creation of public money, naturally citizens will expect you to give back to the legal system. Maybe some of you must become judges, some of must, you must to go to trial court, some of you must become academicians. So that approach we are trying to bring out, not only I am doing that, some of my colleagues are doing that, those who are chancellors. We always say, look, uh, this is all creation of the government out of public money. So that approach we are trying to develop. And situation may change. I mean, my idea of speaking in presence of five vice chancellors was to bring best out of them. And nothing more than that. <laughs> right. Thank you, sir. Thank you.